Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Dementia Researcher podcast. I'm Dr Emily Oliver, and having been on the podcast a few times before, I'm delighted to finally get my chance to sit in the host's chair. For those who haven't read my regular blogs on the Dementia Researcher website, I'm a registered mental health nurse, and since finishing my PhD in 2019, I worked as a consultant admiral nurse at Dementia UK, and I'm now the lead nurse for dementia at Portsmouth Hospital University NHS Trust. I specialise in dementia care since qualifying, and I'm really passionate about the care for older people, specifically those with dementia, and specifically in acute hospitals. My clinical academic doctorate, funded by the NIHR, or National Institute of Health Research, and supported by the University of Southampton, explored the work system factors of the acute wars and the effect on nursing staff capacity. I've also participated and led on other research studies that focuses on this topic. It is through my own research that I've become aware of the great work being done by the NHR Centre for Engagement and Dissemination. And today I'm really pleased to be joined by three guests who were all instrumental in their recently published work, which brought together NIHR research on several aspects of dementia, including topics such as loneliness in people with dementia and their carers, communication with dementia patients, and barriers in accessing dementia care. It is this report, the research within it, and the work it took to collate it that we will discuss today. So let me introduce our three guests. <clears throat> Joining me today, we've got Anne Pascoe, who is the carer and founder and chair of Connecting Communities. We've got Christina Victor, who is a pre- professor of gerontology and public health at Brunel University, London. And we also have Nick Spirit, who is responsible for the stakeholder engagement management at the NIHR Centre for Engagement and Dissemination. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. If we just go around and have a few introductions, and Anne, I'll come to you first. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved with the NIHR. Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anne Pasco, and 15 years ago, we came to Scottish Highlands to retire, and I'm still trying to retire. When Andrew, my husband, was diagnosed in 2006 with vascular dementia. Of course, our plans for traveling and exploring the world in our retirement came to a dead stop. I was told you have two options. You can leave him, which of course wasn't an option, or you can learn to live with it. But I chose a third route, which was to change the situation we found ourselves in. So I became a carer activist and spoke out whenever I could. In 2012, I set up the first rural dementia-friendly community in Scotland, which was quite radical in those days. But interestingly, we found that in a rural setting, we had to practice social inclusion for everyone, not just for people with dementia. And over time, we've developed a circle of support which provides support for all older folk in our rural community, including dementia, and covers both undiagnosed, which is more prevalent, as well as diagnosed people with dementia. Plus, we train all of our staff to an enhanced dementia level. So I have a lot of lived experience, which I draw on. And when asked by the NIHR to review the dementia research for the alerts, I jumped to the chance. Thank you, Anne. And it'll be so interesting to hear all about that further on today. So next, can I go to Professor Victor? Do you mind if we call you Christina? Is that all oh. right? Please call me Christina. Sounds far too grand. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Christina, just tell us, about yourself and how you got involved in this project as well. Well, um, so I'm Professor of Gerontology and Public Health at Brunel University in in West London. And I've had an interesting and diverse career, but two strands, I think, have underpinned my uh, developing research career. Once I've, once one, one aspect is I've always been interested in well-being, whether that's quality of life or uh, a uh, life satisfaction or all the different ways that we we can think about it so I've always been interested in that and my principal research interest has been looking at that for older adults so inevitably dementia is something that uh, is uh, affects older adults more than the rest of the population so I my research sort of expanded into that area and actually I've had a long engagement with NIHR I was just thinking when you asked me the question that I was the ref- the first chair of the South Central Research for Patient Benefit panel. So I think that also um, identifies something else that's been really important across my career, um, and that is engagement with uh, 
what we used to call patient and public and the name changes. But I think for us as a researcher, for the research group I'm part of and for the university where I work, public engagement in research is absolutely crucial. The, um, the, um, in the Royal Charter for Brunel University London, it says the mission of Brunel is to do research that's of benefit to society. And I like to think that's been the sort of motto that's guided my research career and hence a link to NIHR. That's great. I think we should all have that as a tagline in yeah, research, shouldn't great, we? It's great, yeah, it's a great, it's a great, um, uh, I think it's, it's a great shorthand for a lot of the public institutions. Absolutely. We'll have to write that down afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And Nick, can I come to you next? Yeah, so hi everyone. I'm Nick Spirit. I'm a Stakeholder Engagement Manager at the NIHR Centre for Engagement and Dissemination. My background or my degree was actually in microbiology and that sort of led me to develop an interest in sort of science and research. And I suppose it led me to where I am today and my role, which is focused on helping incorporate the voices of health and care professionals as well as patients, carers and the public into the work that we do at the centre. Thank you. I feel very privileged to be here today with all three of you. What a great um, opportunity to host this, so thank you. So Nick, I'm going to come to you first, so help us set the scene as such. So many of our listeners are outside of the UK, um, most of them will have heard of the NHR, but can you tell us about the Centre for Engagement and Dissemination or CED, it might be easier to coin it as that. Yeah, so the NHR Centre for Engagement and Dissemination, or CED, was actually launched last April 2020. So we're coming up to our year anniversary and it incorporates the functions of two previous centres, the NHR Dissemination Centre and NHR Involve. So the centre itself really focuses on, on two key aspects. We promote the engagement and involvement of patients, carers, and the public in sort of all parts of the research journey. And we also support research dissemination and knowledge mobilization, and essentially encourage the sort of translation of research findings into improved treatments and services. Thank you. And so obviously this is for dementia, but actually the NHR funds so many different research projects. So how do you decide what we should focus on? Yeah, it's a good question. So I suppose it's worth providing a bit of context to the outputs of the centre itself. And on the dissemination side of things, we have sort of three key outputs. We have alerts, which are short, accessible research summaries of recently published NHR funded research, and they're presented in plain English. We have collections, which group together alerts on a specific theme or, or topic, and they're really sort of brought to life then by, by commentary um, for people who are interested in that research. And then finally, we have themed reviews, which are more dynamic reviews of, of bodies of evidence, and they're very much focused on relevant research. So most recently, we had the long COVID themed review, and we're currently doing one on young people and, and mental health but in terms of selecting the research fields, because we're obviously an NHR centre, we're led by the priority themes. And obviously, when the research is, is funded by the programmes, we then get the, the sort of tail end of the publications coming through. And we're sort of led by those priorities. And, and we decide on, on what publications to, to action into alerts via their actionability and, and how they can sort of implement practice. Great. And I'm sure our listeners will be really keen to know what the priorities are. So we'll probably come back to that at the end as a key point to note. So this is great that we have this in the UK. And do you know if there's anything similar in other countries? Or It's a, it's a good question. I think obviously in the UK and abroad, there's a lots of different research funders. But I think having a centre which is very much focused on the two aspects of dissemination mm -hmm. and patient and public partnerships, whether it be involvement, engagement or participation is quite, is quite different. And I think that sort of sets it aside because those two aspects are actually really, really important. And to have a centre that just focuses on those is quite different. So we're very lucky. I'm very pleased because your latest collection or the one that you worked on together was on dementia research. So why was that? How did that come about? And that's open to any of you. 
I suppose I can sort of kick it off. Um, and I suppose it goes back to the, the point I made before, which is that dementia is obviously a priority theme of the NIHR. So at the center of engagement for dissemination, for engagement dissemination, we, we were seeing a lot of sort of high quality dementia research coming through and, and being published. And as we were sort of developing the alerts, we were building a great selection of, of research summaries surrounding lots of interesting aspects of dementia. And with that, we thought that the, the research and the alerts would really benefit from being put together as a collection and receiving commentaries from, from individuals for whom the research would be relevant. So Anne was, was one of the commentators, for instance, and it was just a real opportunity for us to get insight from people who the research was for um, to see what they can learn from the research and, and how it can benefit them. Right. And on that note, this report is published now. So who is, that, who is it aimed at? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think the report is is really for anyone who has an interest in dementia research. There are obviously specific, specific alerts within the collection, which could be of more interest to certain audiences. But I think, you know, with over half of the UK population, for instance, knowing someone who's been diagnosed with research, I think the collection can really be of interest to, to a, lot of, a lot of people. Great. And what do you hope after reading it, and this is open to everybody, people will do with that that knowledge and that learning that they got from that. I think one of the, the great things about the collection is it shows the breadth of dementia research. So perhaps often we think of um, people in, in labs trying to find you know, the, the, the pathways to disease and to find the cure, or we or and not think about research that looks at What's the experience of people living with dementia and their carers? And it's going to take a wee while before we can find a cure. So what, what is research telling us how we can make um, life better or the best it can be for people with dementia and their carers? So the thing I liked about this particular thing was the, the broad spectrum and the recognition of that, that dementia is studied across the sort of academic disciplines. And that's one of the nice things about it. Every discipline can, can contribute to, a, to addressing a, a major health challenge. And I think the other thing I would hope, particularly from the social science research, not necessarily um, the projects I'm involved in, but more widely than that, is to take some of the stigma away from dementia. You know, dementia is not part of normal aging. And it's a health problem like we have other health problems like heart disease or osteoporosis. And, and we need to think about it like that as, as, a, as a health issue and not stigmatise people or their, their carers um, because we think it's um, in some way, you know, just part of normal ageing and it should happen to everybody. So. And Anne, did you want to add something? Yes, if I could. I think Christine has hit the nail on the head over there because... As a carer, for me, research is absolutely crucial. And of course, we're all sitting here waiting for a cure to be found, you know, that the lab work has been done. And I know there's a lot of work around drug trials and other kinds of brain research, but so often that social research is forgotten. And that's why it was so refreshing to see all of this work being done. Because if there isn't social research, it means we're actually letting down dementia families by not supporting them to be able to live to our best ability and improving our lives right now. You know, and when one reads, um, for example, those alerts, you realize that um, so much is going on out there and it can help us. But the key also, of course, is to get it published uh, so that these things can be rolled out across the whole country and across the world, not just to where the research is done. And Anne, on that note, so you... As you said, you're both, you were a carer for your husband and you're also doing, are very active in the community. So things like this, what does that mean for, for both you as a carer and also for that community side? Well, as a carer, as I say, we're always waiting for a cure to be found, but you know, it's, it's not going to happen for a long time. So that social research is so, so important. But an interesting thing that I also think is that, you know, there's so many communities, rural and urban, not only in the UK, but all around the world. I mean, we've actually done work with communities in Australia, in Canada, in, in, in the US, and they, they support thousands of people with dementia. So you actually have these lived experience communities that researchers can drop into. Um, 
And I just think it would be incredible if that work could be harnessed and the different models be properly researched, but more importantly, evaluated so that the outcomes can be measured and appraised to see if they're working or not. Because so often, you know, research is done, we've seen up here, research is done, and you have these sort of, you always have to have outputs and outcomes, and you have the outcomes, but nobody ever tell, you know, nobody comes back to see if they're actually working. Mm. And that is, um, I think that's important to find out uh, whether this, this, you know, whether this can be done. Really important. And obviously, and um, we've got you, you were part of this process and it was that as, as in your carer role or in your community role? How did you get involved? And how important is it to involve people that have got that lived experience in processes like that? Well, I think it's key because the difficulty is as a carer, you're always so tired, you know, and you always have all these other commitments. And it's so hard to get carers to actually open up and do it. But if you can get across to carers that the knowledge they have in their head is, is precious. And if researchers could access that. Now, how did I get involved? Um, I actually don't know, Nick might be able to. I don't know how he found me, but he <laughs> found me so, and asked me. And as I say, I'm as being a carer activist, I realized a long time ago that the only way you're ever going to get any support or get any further in this dementia world or make change is to actually... Um, Speak about it. Speak out about it. And Nick, you found me and I spoke out about it. So. <laughs> and Nick, do you want to follow on from that then? How did you find Anne? And also, how can other people get involved if they'd like? Yeah, so as as part of the sort of process for collections at the moment at least it's once we start building a sort of selection of alerts around a similar topic or theme, it's really trying to identify people who would be interested in it and people for whom the research would be relevant. So I think I think it might have actually been Google search that I found and um, so I, yeah, I think it was through that way. but I think the collection as a whole is is really as sort of Christine alluded to, it's so useful in bringing together different aspects of dementia research because it is such a, a big and important space. But I think it also really highlights the importance of sort of hearing from, many different quarters in order to sort of ensure dementia research and, and practice is heading in the right direction for those most affected by it. And I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, learning from people like Anne who can share such, you know, important experience and insight, which can really then make a difference later on in research. And I think for this collection, by sort of getting a bit of that insight and getting a bit of that experience, alongside the research is is really great and I'm yeah hoping that it will spark discussion and spark conversation which is so important to then making sure that the research in the field can progress and, and make a difference. Essential isn't it to have people like you with us Anne. So let's talk about the research itself then within the report. So Christina I'll come to you first because Although you were involved in this sort of collapse, the pulling together of it, actually, your, some of your research was included in the review. Yes. Is that right? Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Oh, dear. Always dangerous to ask an ac academic to talk about <laughs> their pet subject. So the two papers that link to the project I'm involved in, which is called the Ideal Project, which is uh, run out of the University of Exeter and is led by Professor Linda Clare, and has been funded by NH, NIHR, ESRC, Alzheimer's Society. And we're grateful for the support of particularly NIHR and ESRC to get us going. The focus ideal is not a, a you know, we didn't just call it that. It actually stands for improving experience of dementia and enhancing active life. So our group is very much focused on living well. What are the factors that help people to live well? And as part of that, I have a particular interest in social connections. I'm particularly interested in loneliness and isolation. And so we, in our, um, in our project, we've got measures of both. So I had the opportunity to look at um, loneliness amongst people with dementia and their carers, and also social isolation, and to look at whether it was better or worse than the general population or and, and differences between people with dementia and, and caregivers. So, um, and we know social connections are important for well-being. And um, I think that's 
you know, I'm I'm not so um, I'm not so uh, seduced by the idea about being interested in loneliness because it you know has a larger uh, chances of killing you than smoking. I think we should be interested in loneliness and isolation because it's as I think COVID has showed us, social connections are key to living well. Whether you're young, you're old, you've got dementia, you've got other diseases, and it, it so so for me it was an opportunity to to um, look at my pet subject in a in a in a in a really important group. Absolutely, I think you're right. I think this year when I mean, we knew how important social contact is, but this year has just highlighted it, hasn't yeah. it? And specifically for people with dementia and their carers, we know how isolated they've been. A lot of Social support services have not been open, so, so important. Thank you. And so, Anne? Do you know what broke my heart during all of this? Is that I kept thinking of these people with dementia in care homes. And even, I mean, I see how my husband in a support system here at home, and he's, he was so confused. He didn't know why people wouldn't come and visit us. He didn't understand why we couldn't go out. He didn't understand why I wouldn't let people into the house. Um, he's quite a gregarious, you know, he loves to talk to all sorts of people. And um, I, But at least I was able to explain to him, and because we were shielding together, he didn't lose me. Now, if he had lost me as well, if he had been in a care home, as so this is where it really came home to us, I think, this, you know, the, the people with dementia living in these care homes alone, and suddenly everything was cut off. Mm. Um, I, I, terrible, just terrible. It really is. Um, in this collection, there is research on care homes in included, isn't there? Well, I think I mean care homes are extraordinarily interesting, um, but some, but rather difficult places to study. So when I first started my career, care homes were essentially publicly funded, and it was very much easier to get access to do research in those in those settings than it is now. I think they are very interesting settings for they are often very cut off from society so they're not part of the local community and particularly with covid that set of sense of distance dislocation from the wider social world i think is 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 quite problematic and something that i'm quite interested in is again how you maintain social connections when you're in that that those when you're frail and uh, perhaps ha have cognitive challenges that don't make and social engagement um, easy and thinking what it was like in COVID with trying to learn new technologies. And one of the things I'm, I'm very interested in in care homes, although this may, may, may want to edit it out because it might seem rather weird, is touch. So I think the other thing COVID has shown to us is not just social relationships, but actually the physicality. So if, if you think if you're in a care home all the time, Perhaps you only get touched once a week when your daughter comes to visit you. All the rest of the time you get touched because people are doing things to you. You're a nurse, you know about therapeutic touch. So I, I think it's been a, I think it's a, people, we try very hard to make care homes good and it's an observation, not a criticism of the people who work in them, but it, it is problematic to maintain that, so the social health of the, the community, I think. There is so many areas that we still need to research aren't they yeah. or need further research we yeah. could we'll absolutely and nick um of all the collection there's we you know we've got that loneliness piece there was a bit of, of care home what really stuck out for you in one and within the collection and something you think others should know i i think for me the, the collection was really interesting because it was a lot of the research was obviously focused on the carer side of things and as we were saying before, I think that the social science of dementia research is, is such an important area that always needs more and more research done on it. And I think it's I think it's interesting about the care home research as well, because I think care homes themselves, in, in order for improve, I think there has to be research to really acknowledge the, the difficulties that the care homes face in trying to wow. implement research. And, I, and I, I definitely see that research coming through now. And I think it will be a future collection um, where we can really focus on, on care home research. But the collection on dementia really, really stood out to me because of, of the focus on, on carers. And I think having the commentaries is, is really important to then help us 
get a better insight of, of how the research benefits them and, and what further needs to be done to, to help that process. And Anne, having seen the collection as well, obviously as a carrier yourself, are there any parts of, of it that really stuck out to you? Or uh, Yes, the, when Nick sent them to me, I think Nick, there were 15 in all, there were 15 pieces of research. I probably could have answered all of them, but, you know, because they really took my fancy and stuff. But the ones that really interested me were around social, uh, around loneliness and isolation, around carers. But two other areas, one definitely around training. I think training is so important. And I'm not sure, again, I said earlier, you know, that training um, outcomes should be evaluated and measured and then not just stop as a piece of research, but then put out so that other people can be trained. For example, one of the, the training that we were reading about, there were issues around cost, you know, to, to implement this training. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why can't it go online? We've had to put all our, all our training online now. Why can't it go online? And then even somebody up, us up here in the, you know, the Scottish Highlands in the middle of nowhere, we could access that training. And it would be so valuable. I also think not only for people, um, trained parents, you know, for, for not only training for professionals, but carers need training and we don't know it. When Andrew was first diagnosed, I was so bewildered. I mean, I, I, I didn't know which way to turn. And I actually went back to university and got a master's in dementia because I thought I'd got to learn about this, you know, what I'm having to deal with here. I also got a Churchill Fellowship and I went to India to learn about um, carer stress and stuff like this. So I was lucky to be able to do those things and most carers, I suppose, couldn't. But if all the research around training was actually made easily available and user-friendly, there would be such a huge uptake, not only for professionals, but carers as well. I think that's, uh, I think that's very important. The other piece of research that really interested me was also the working, you know, the carers working or not. And I actually found when I stopped working a year ago, you know, because of COVID, I was, we were shielding. So I, that was, I also um, stopped going to meetings and, and having to travel to meetings, etc. And I found by being home alone, all the time, not home alone, but home here with Andrew, just the two of us alone, I think in my mind, I became a worse carer because I didn't have that outside interest and I couldn't get out and I wasn't getting out. Now, he was cock a hoop because I was home all the time. So, I mean, he was actually thrilled that I was home and me and the animals, you know, I'm here all the time. But mm. I have to say that it made my caring life very much more difficult. So I actually think whether a carer gets out to do a job, as many carers have to actually, I suppose, support families, or in my case, where one can go out and do a lot of, you know, do community work and put your knowledge back into the community. I think getting out those few hours every day actually gives you sanity to be able to come back into this dementia world again and deal with it. I found that research very interesting. And I think you just outlined there another bit of research that we can do. I hope somebody is jotting these down because actually there is so much more. And But there is also a lot that's already been done. And one of the challenges that researchers and me myself, I found this a challenge is when we do the research and we get these outcomes, actually turning that into something usable or something that means something in practice, you know, so that we can support people like you, Anne, and, and people that are, are caring for or living with dementia. So any advice on how we get better at this in research in general, but particularly dementia research, just implementing those findings into practice? And Christina, I'll start with you. Oh, thank you. You start with the academic who never implements anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> well, I think there, there are there are there are a number of. I, I, perhaps I might be a more bit more expansive in interpreting your question. I think some of the things we can do as researchers is is challenge myths and stereotypes. That that's the that's the first thing that I think we can do to say, not just that. Um, Dementia is a, a disease, but people with dementia show variation in terms of their um, material health and other social resources, and that can affect outcomes. So that I think a really important lesson from dementia research is that people with dementia aren't a big homogeneous lump. Um, mm. You know, they show the same social axes of social different 
differentiation as the rest of us. So I think that's an important thing that when, and for me, even perhaps in the kind of work we do, what we're contributing to is identifying that people with dementia are individuals with a biography and a history. And I think we're, although perhaps our kind of work is not directly influenced, we're contributing to notions around personalised care that actually you need to think about the individual and not put them in a box as this is a person with dementia. This is a person with dementia who, you know, may be from a very privileged background or a less privileged background, has a, a supportive family, doesn't have a family. So I think a, a lot of the kind of research that uh, we're doing is at that first stage before we're developing I I interventions, we need to sort of scope out the landscape and the I'm going to answer the question that you were asking my colleagues earlier. I think one of the things that the collection does is not just look at what it's like to have dementia now, but thinking about what are people with dementia going to look like in 20 years' time. And I was really pleased that the collection picked up a paper from black and minority ethnic groups, because at the moment, 5% of people with dementia come from minority communities. But in 10 years time, that's going to look very different. And we need to think about how we, we're going to, um, to care for those kinds of um, groups. So that's a par par partial answer to your question. I think the other way that people like myself, so we weren't a program grant, we weren't developing inter interventions, we're trying to understand what gives purpose, meaning and quality to people's lives, is the involvement of people with dementia and their carers. So what our project, we've been extraordinarily fortunate to have been supported by a group called the Always Group, who are a group of people with dementia and carers who've been with us right from when we wrote the first application in 2014. So when we're, as we're doing our research, we're constantly involving them in terms of the questions to ask, but also when we've got the results, what are the really, what, are, what does it mean? And then how can we take that to uh, people like the Alzheimer's Society and help them develop policy and practice um, around, let's say, for example, loneliness and, and isolation. Mm. So I'm, I'm not sure I've entirely answered the question, but I think it's engagement with the community that you're working with, but also engagement with the people who are going to use your findings. So the Alzheimer's Society, we, we our group, um, Professor Clare and group, we've been to the sort of all-party parliamentary group on dementia. We talked to the Alzheimer's Society. So I think it's a, it's a constant conversation. Mm. And I think it really, what you're saying really resonates with me as a clinical academic. So yeah. when I was doing the PhD, I was working in the place that I was able to research. And actually, that was so beneficial because I could see the issues or concerns in practice and work on those and bring those back. So I think the importance of, like you said, that lived experience, knowing what the areas that are needed on the ground is. So, so one of one of the things we've done in our project when we when we um, and get, do go to the ideal website that's ideal <laughs> at dot com at Exeter I think also you can find us. Um, one of the things we've done is when we've published papers we write a lay summary and involve our people with dementia and carers and try to so that those are all there so we're we're privileged to be funded by the taxpayer and people who support the Alzheimer's Society as a group we a core value for us is giving back to the people who support us so I think to be able it it's, it, you know, we can't talk to every family with dementia in the country, but we can try and make our research available in accessible formats so that people can, um, you know, can benefit and and help us to develop it further. We're we're only one part of the uh, the dementia sort of research community, and you know, we we need you know, we take advice from the, those who who uh, you know are experts in different areas as well. Thank you. And Nick, I'll come to you then about dissemination and turning findings into practice. How does the CED play a role in that or what can, I, what can we do to make that better? 
Yeah, I think it's such an interesting um, conversation. And I think, you know, to echo what yourself and, and Christina has said, you know, it's so important making sure that you have that engagement and involvement with the end users. And as Christina said, there's there's no point in doing an intervention if you don't have an idea of, of who it's for and, and how it can work. And that's why lived experience and insight is, is so important in that respect. I think as well, there's the, the thinking of, okay, once my research is published, then is that it? And that's definitely not the case. You know, thinking past just a publication in a journal is so important. And that's sort of where I suppose dissemination and knowledge mobilization sort of kicks in. And to really be thinking that, thinking of those aspects as a researcher is, is really important. And I suppose that's part of our aim at the centre is to get researchers thinking about, okay, what's next? How do we make a difference? How do we ensure that the people who we're essentially doing this research for can actually use it and benefit from it? Um, and I think, you know, having conversations like we're having now on the podcast, just talking about research, you know, it doesn't have to be a massive step, but it's it's one of those stepping stones and just speaking about what could be good research in the future or what's helping with implementation at the moment, I think is, is really helpful. Thank you. And Anne, did you want to say something? Yes. Um, from, a, uh, from a community perspective, I mean, we've always fulfilled the needs. It's always been the community that's come to us and said, we want this, we need this, whether it be something you know, around isolation, around loneliness. In fact, a new project that we are looking at now is around mental health issues as a result of um, uh, you know, as, as a result of COVID. So we always, the community comes to us and tells us what they need and then we start trying to do something about it. So I, I'd say from a community perspective, to do social research, all you have to do is go find one of your local communities in your area, see what they're doing, follow up on their outcomes and assess whether or not they're working. But then more importantly, publish it. And, you know, so other successful models can be re replicated all over so that we don't have to keep reinventing wheels. Um, and from a care aspect perspective, it's really best speak to dementia families and learn from the experience. If we have time, I have a, I have a story about that. Um, my husband was a keen photographer before his diagnosis. And uh, after his diagnosis, he tried to paint some of these photographs. And of course, I went into wife mode and I said, darling, those awful, stick to your photography. <laughs> don't, don't try painting. <laughs> well, to my horror, I then went, when I went, uh, you know, went back to Union and, and um, one of the models, modules I was doing was around creative work. And I learned that while the short-term memory and then long-term memory you know, are the first things to go, the last ones are creativity and imagination. I, I didn't know that. So, of course, I thought, oh, my goodness, I've messed up again you know, as a carer. So I went back and I said to Andrew, darling, why don't you try painting one of your pictures? And I must say, because the he came back to me and said, you told me I'm rubbish. <laughs> but we persevered and you know today Andrew's art is the single key concept that gets him up in the morning it keeps him going a good part of the day it's kept him going through COVID this last year it's kept me going in fact it's become an obsession of his but a wonderful obsession because his art is something quite extraordinary to behold and you know maybe stories like that can be inspiration for other people to actually follow but I think one has to have, when you go and try and get money to get other people, you know, to be able to get art into a community, mm. they want proven research. You know, they want, how do we know art works? Well, I mean, from a lived experience point of view, our family couldn't exist now without Andrew doing this. He was never an artist, he was an engineer before, but not, he was never an artist. So that's the kind of work, and it, that, the same is around art, music, dance, you know, all these things social areas that we work in. So more research could be done around that would be fantastic. And yeah, I think there are lots of families who would be able to support researchers who want to do it. Mm. And I think you're right, those lived experience stories like the one you've just told, they can be the catalyst, can't they, for research to happen. You know, yeah. you told us your experience there and, and we can go away and think about how we can harness what you told us and use that for research and be able to disseminate that. But I'm trying to show them lots of other people like that. So, but it's got to somehow, and I'm not a researcher, so you know, the researchers have to gather that 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 information and 
get it out there so that people with the money can, you know, for it to eventually become a statutory service. Wouldn't it be incredible if all these things could be part of, you know, not just coming in and cleaning and washing and doing all that stuff, but actually these um, the good things to give person quality of life and good well-being, you know, these could be just part of our statutory services. Fantastic. Thank you. So we know that a lot of early career researchers are involved with the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast and blog. So I just want to ask you, if you were to give one bit of advice to an early career researcher, what would that be? And um, Nick, if we start with you first. Yeah, I think that's that's a tough question um, to, to answer. But I think my advice, obviously, coming from the Centre for Engagement Dissemination is, is to really obviously think about who you're doing the research for, how it can make a difference and make sure that you, you know, you keep going with the research once it's published and, and, and make a difference. Thank you. And shall we go to you next? Yes, I, I mean, I think um, you simply, every single person who's doing research probably knows somebody who has a dementia, whether it be a loved one you know, your own family or whether it be through a, on a professional basis. Ask them, speak to them. What, you know, what, what do you need? What would you like that would make your life better? And that usually that conversation can be of, I think, to research projects. Mm-hmm. You know, that's possibly the first thing is to find out what do people, what do families want, what they need. Thank you. And Christina, same question. Oh, well, difficult, difficult one to answer. I, I would say, I think perhaps some early career researchers have put off dementia because they think it's depressing. Um, but I, I think. A, a career in in dementia research is incredibly rewarding because of you meet some fantastic colleagues who are in, in the research community but you also get to meet um, an incredible group of older people mostly older people because we we mustn't forget that there is a, a number of people who get dementia at a, a younger age for which um, I know there's a particular group at UCL who work with them but that's um, that. That's a different. Um, that's a, that's a different issue. Um, I think it's 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 yeah, it's not depressing. It's really rewarding, and you can really make a difference. And if you're not an if you're not if you don't see yourself as an expert in dementia, there's still a place for you because we need people who are interested in well-being. So there's lots of opportunity if you think, well, I'm an anthropologist and, you know, what, 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 what role for, is there for me in dementia? Oh, yes, there is in about, you know, the different ways communities live. So I, I would say it's a, it's a great field to work in because you, 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 you're going to meet fantastic people in every phase of your career. Definitely. And I think... Actually, each and every one of them would be more than happy to talk to any early career researcher yeah. if they're wanting to get involved, aren't they? So I think we're also keen to get more people yeah. involved. We, so. we have we have at Brunel, so it isn't um, it isn't a group that's particularly for dementia, but it's the group of older adults who support ageing research at Brunel. And when I say, you know, we're organising a seminar to discuss a research project I'm running or one of my colleagues is running. And they, they go, oh, yeah, that's great. And we get a group together. If I say to them, we've got a new PhD student or a new postdoc coming, they want to talk to you about their project. I have, I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. So my, my, my people, uh, my, my reference group really love working with um, new researchers, be they PhD students or early career researchers, postdocs, they really, really like working with them. I think they'll, they'll give you so much time that people are unbelievably generous. Thank you. I think we'll end there because that is just such a lovely note to end on. I think we've touched on so many things that are important today. So not just the collection, but actually the breadth of, of dementia research that's out there, the need to include the lived experience and how we improve dissemination and actually just how we get more people involved and and how we will welcome more people to be involved. So thank you so much. So 
just so everybody remembers your names again, if they can get in touch with you. So I'd just like to thank you all. So it's Anne Pasco, Professor Christina Victor and Nick Spirit. Thank you. If you haven't already looked at this collection, you'll find it um, on a link below this podcast or visit evidence.nihr.ac.uk slash collection slash dementia. We have profiles on all of today's panellists on the website, including details of their Twitter accounts. Please take a look and go to the Evidence website to have a look at what they do. Finally, please remember to like, subscribe in any uh, app you're listening to. And thank you for listening. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.